You're listening to Podcast to Practice, brought to you by Springer Healthcare IME. Podcast to Practice brings you expert-led independent medical education discussions, inspiring healthcare professionals to maximize their learning and make measurable changes in their own clinical practice. This podcast is part of an independent medical education program entitled Biomarker Positive Disease, a personalized approach to selecting targeted therapies in lung cancer and beyond, and is supported by an independent educational grant from Roche and Illumina. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast focusing on recent advancements in the management of non-small cell lung cancer. I'm Dr. Lisa Hendricks, a pulmonologist specializing in thoracic oncology, and I'll be your host for today's discussion. Today, I will discuss a case involving a 40-year-old male with a history of psychosis, currently asymptomatic and off medication. He is an ex-smoker with a 10-pack year history, presenting with a cough and dyspnea. A chest X-ray revealed a tumor in the left parahela region. PET-CT imaging identified FGG-positive multiple small lung nodules, a parahyla left tumor, and multiple bone metastases without a soft tissue component. Bronchoscopy with brush and washing confirmed non-small cell lung cancer subtype adenocarcinoma, but insufficient tumor cells were available for molecular analysis on pd one testing. A liquid biopsy showed no oncogenic driver mutations. The patient was diagnosed with a CT24 N0M1C non-small cell adenocarcinoma. So how to proceed with this patient? Do you have sufficient information to treat the patient? Would you like to have pd one Would you like to have molecular analysis? Or do you trust the negative liquid biopsy? Well, first, let's discuss the implications of a negative liquid biopsy. While a negative result doesn't rule out actionable mutations, it emphasizes the need for tissue-based testing. Different techniques for molecular testing and liquid biopsies, such as digital droplet PCR and next-generation sequencing, vary in sensitivity and specificity, underscoring the importance of comprehensive genomic profiling. The patient also had bone metastasis, so a bone biopsy for molecular analysis was considered. But we must acknowledge potential pitfalls. Bone biopsies often yield limited viable tumor cells due to the mineralized matrix, and decalcification processes can degrade nucleic acids impacting NGS accuracy. Therefore, alternative tissue sources might be preferable if available. In this case, it has been indicated that further tissue cannot be obtained through bronchoscopy. It was discussed with the pulmonologist, raising the question of surgical intervention. So would you, in this case, resect a pulmonary nodule uh, to acquire adequate tissue for comprehensive testing? Well, this was a young patient, not a heavy smoker, so I really would argue for additional testing. So given the limited biopsy material, a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, wedge resection was performed. The non-small cell subtype adenocarcinoma was confirmed, and subsequent NGS revealed email for ALK rearrangement. Then with the identification of an ALK rearrangement uh, in a patient with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, the next step in management becomes crucial. ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer has specific first-line treatment options, mainly being ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors, including alectinib, brigatinib, or lorlatinib, which all have demonstrated significant efficacy in this subset of patients. So how to choose between these drugs? And also other questions. Should brain imaging be considered in this patient? Well, given the propensity for ALK rearranged tumors to metastasize to the CNS, but also maybe a little bit different efficacy of the different ALK TKI in the brain, baseline brain MRI is very valuable to assess for asymptomatic metastasis and for guiding treatment planning. If you look back historically, in terms of first-line treatment, ALK inhibitors have shown superior progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy. As I already stated, it is essential to tailor the choice of ALK TKI treatment based on the patient's overall condition, CNS involvement, and potential side effects. I think it's important we know from the recent update of the CROWN data, the five-year survival, that it was very good to control the CNS with a hazard ratio of below 0.1. I think this is better than you can achieve with electinib or brigatinib. But I think in this case, the major drawback of lorlatinib would be the history of psychosis of this patient, because we know that uh, lorlatinib can cause neurocognitive and psychiatric side effects. 
So maybe in this patient, I would choose another alt-TKI than lorlatinib. But if this patient would not have had this medical history, I would have gone for lorlatinib. Unfortunately, even with a very long disease control, in the end, patients will have progressive disease. So then one is encountered with the question upon progression of non-oligometastatic disease, should a new biopsy be performed? And does this decision depend on the type of the first-line alt-TKI used? I think in general, you can debate it after lorlatinib uh, because there are no registered and approved alt-TKI upon progression on lorlatinib. But in general, I think acquiring a new biopsy, whether liquid or tissue, but tissue if liquid is negative, is critical to detect resistance mutations and guide subsequent lines of treatment. As already stated, the type of initial ALK-TKI can influence the resistance profile, making rebiopsy a key component in managing disease progression effectively. My main conclusions and takeaways are that molecular analysis should be performed for all non-squamous, non-small cell, and especially for young patients with a low or never smoking history, but really for all non-squamous. Liquid biopsy can be false negative. Targeted therapies can result in prolonged survival, and ALK, uh, positive non-small cell lung cancer, is, I think, a typical example. And the choice for the specific first-line TKI depends on the patient and tumor characteristics, the patient wish, and availability. Thank you for joining us today. We've discussed a complex case of metastatic ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer, from diagnostic challenges to the selection of targeted therapies. This case underscores the importance of precision oncology and personalized treatment strategies. Stay tuned for more discussions and cutting-edge development in this field. We appreciate your time and look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for listening to Podcast to Practice, brought to you by Springer Healthcare IME. For more information on our educational programs available, visit ime.springerhealthcare.com.